Good morning. If you're guests of this, welcome. Uh, we're thrilled that you're here, and it's, it's a real privilege to worship with you this morning. We, we are a community, a, a church, and the way we like to think of things in ourselves and in God's kingdom is through this rhythm of gathering and scattering, and so like this would be gathering, and in our understanding, like there is this uh, incredible place in God's economy to come together and be a part of a community and worship together and grow relationally between ourselves and others and ourselves and the Lord. And yet we're constantly trying to remind ourselves that like the sum total of what it means to be the church isn't this. This is, this is about one-seventh of it, and so you'll hear us use the phrase scattering a lot, and that's what, what we mean by that is simply uh, the reminder that God affords us all kinds of opportunities in our organic, everyday lives uh, to serve him and tell his story, uh, not with megaphones so much as with a serving towel over our arm and just mattering in the world that God has us in. So welcome to Narrate. It's a thrill to have you here this morning. Uh, this morning's real fun and unique and a little nerve-wracking for me because my old boss is here and friend, but uh, we've been talking about this for weeks, and so my friend Vern is here, who is the pastor of Harvest and Billings, and so most of you know uh, we have two moms, separate conversation, one in Billings at Harvest, one in Bozeman at Journey, and so Vern would be one of our moms. So would you give Vern a narrate welcome? Thanks. Hi, everybody. Oh, thanks. I'm sure uh, glad to be here, uh, this is my first opportunity actually to uh, worship with you guys, and I'm pretty fulfilled already, so I don't know, I'm sorry that I'm going to talk for a while, uh, because uh, I sure enjoyed the music and uh, just being in the vibe with you guys today. I want you to know that Harvest Church is proud to be uh, one of the moms of Narrate, and uh, our church thinks of you fondly, is proud of you. Uh, prays for you often. Uh, we kind of keep an eye on you from a distance and enjoy uh, God's spirit, his move amongst you guys. And, and so we're celebrating a lot the things that God's doing here. So for me, real neat opportunity to, to come and, and open the word with you for a little bit. And I'm going to kind of be preaching to the choir today. I want to affirm the things that you're doing and uh, the some of the baseline theology and ethic of this place and what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. And um, but you're also going to pick up from me a little bit today some of uh, your own DNA and uh, the kind of some of the ground level, uh, real in the dirt things that created who I am as a Christ follower and the way Harvest Church goes, and and then some of the stuff then that is happening here. You'll, you'll kind of get some of that where that's come from, and um, as it comes through Adam and his team, and then to the broader community at large. And so church planning uh, is something that's close to our hearts. We love uh, the things that God does as he plants new works around the world, and we've gotten to be a part of a few of those. And uh, I want to talk for a moment about uh, one of the great benefits of church planning, starting new works, as it relates to my grandfather, who was 95 years old uh, when we took his driver's license away from him. He died at 97. Uh, this is the reason we took his driver's license away from him. He uh, ha drove a Gran Torino. That's not the reason we took his driver's license, but what happened in the Gran Torino is. So big Gran Torino, and his driveway was very, very long. And so uh, he, when he would start his car, because he was so hard of hearing, the only way he could get the car going or know that it was going as if he just stuffed his foot to the floor right with the accelerator and f turned it over look like when you start your car you don't watch the tack to see if it's going you hear that it starts right so if you're old and can't hear which was the case of m my grandfather you don't know that the car's starting until you hear it and you can't hear it unless it's roaring and so he would always peg it and then fire it up, which was always funny, especially at the golf course, because you could hear it clear on the other side, and people go, oh, Dell just started his car. <laughs> so <laughs> so Dell, his name's Delton, and I called him Dell. We were great friends. So 95 years old, in his driveway, starting up his car, long asphalt driveway, and so fires it up, and, and then as old people are wont to do, uh, forgot to take his foot off the accelerator before he put it into drive. Okay? Now, we call this a neutral drop, something like that, right? So he's got 
accelerated to the floor, car's roaring, puts it in drive, and rockets down his asphalt driveway towards his garage, which is towards the back of his property. And here's what happens. He goes through his garage door and across his garage and over a two-foot deep grease pit at the back of his garage through the cupboards and out the back wall of his garage onto the patio where he splintered his patio furniture and kept going across his grass and hit this gigantic stone barbecue that was in the back corner of his property through this huge stone barbecue, through his back fence, across the alley, through the neighbor's fence, through their clothesline, and stopped about two feet from the corner of their house. It was awesome, right? <laughs> and so, so, so I get the call, and I'm like, so I go over there, and I walk out into the backyard, and I'm just looking at this path of destruction, and I'm standing there, and then the door opens, and my grandfather shuffles down the back steps, you know, and comes up and stands next to me and, and, and we're looking at this carnage and, and he goes, yep, really raised the dickens out here. And then he goes, I never liked that barbecue anyway. And I was so proud of him in that moment. And when I think of church planning, I think of that deal there. Because when you start new works, uh, you, you get to raise the dickens a bit. Uh, but the other thing you get to do is blow through old barbecues, right? Like just like the stuff about church that is bugged you or you found ineffective or impotent or something. You, you go like, we're going to not do that anymore and we're, we're going to recreate. And, and you guys have been doing that. And that's one of the reasons we're so enthused about God's work here is that you're blowing through barbecues and, and building new neat things. And and, and so what I want to talk about for a while today is there are some things, however, that just have to be a part of any authentic move of God through a local church. And I want to talk about one of those in specific today. We're going to take a look at a text of scripture and we're going to go into some ancient history and see what bearing that would have then on a church like Narrate. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 10 for just a little bit. If you've got your text, I'll uh, be reading out of there, and I'm going to uh, kind of read and comment a little bit. Very familiar passage on the screens. Uh, so follow with me, starting on Luke 10, verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law, so lawyer, Pharisee kind of guy, stood up to test Jesus right there. We see his motive, his, his intention is not to follow Jesus or know him, but to test him, he's hoping to trap him. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, that was a very common question of the day, kind of a classic debate, getting the guy's perspective on this. And when they're talking eternal life, they're not talking minimum entrance requirements into heaven. They're talking about the highest quality of life. How can I live the highest quality of life, the very best life in a life that lasts forever? Jesus, being a rabbi, responds the way a rabbi would. He answers the question with a question. What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? This is the ongoing debate of the day. What's the summary of the whole Old Testament law? And even what is the order of the, the commands? How do you rank them? Pretty normal conversation that Jesus has entered into here. Verse 27, he answered. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. So kind of a classic answer. The Shema comes from Deuteronomy. And then he adds, love your neighbor as yourself. He's tipping his hand a little bit here. I think that this is the order. First this one, then this one. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus goes, good answer. It's the right answer. You've, you've answered correctly. And so you do, go ahead and do that and you'll live. And at this point... Uh, what we would maybe expect a lawyer to do is to go, I can't do it. I haven't done it. I, I don't do it. I won't do it. So help me here. At which point Jesus would have said, there you go. That's, that's why I'm here. It's because the Heavenly Father loves you, and so he sent me. And whoever believes in me would not perish but have what you're asking about, eternal life. But instead, there's this little surprise 
uh, verse 29, he wanted to justify himself, wanted to declare himself righteous. He knew that he was not doing what the law commanded, what he even said was the most important part of the law. He knew he wasn't doing it, but he wanted to justify that he wasn't doing this for some people. And so he fires off the question, and who is my neighbor? So he's going, I do this to my neighbor. Now let me get an idea from you, Jesus, if you and I agree on who my neighbor is. Verse 30, Jesus begins telling a story. And it's a story that's famous, world famous. We call it the Good Samaritan. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers and they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and we saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Now, remember that road to Jericho is a path. It's not a road, it's a path. And it's very narrow. If you're going to pass by somebody, you are stepping around them essentially. So to a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him passed by on the other side. And so presumably the guy who is injured is a Jew. And now we've got two elite Jews that are going by him, uh, seeing him there, stepping around him, going by on the other side. And then what Jesus does here is uh, very surprising. This is a twist that nobody would have expected uh, there were, you know, this classic triad of three people, and the third one, uh, they never would have expected the guy that Jesus mentions, which is a Samaritan. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, that would have been gasp in the crowd. Uh, but a Samaritan, as he, right, because the Jews hated the Samaritans, Samaritans hated the Jews. Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. Then the next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And then Jesus asks the kicker question, which of these three do you think these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the conclusion is obvious. And so the lawyer says, Well, the one who had mercy on him, tipping us off that he hates the Samaritan so much he couldn't even say the Samaritan, he had to say the one who had mercy on him. And then Jesus told him, go and do likewise, at which point the lawyer should say, yeah, I don't do that. I don't, um, I don't love my neighbor. And I need God's forgiveness and I need the eternal life that comes through this Jesus. The story of the Good Samaritan generates a question that I want us to deal with for a little bit. And that question is, who should we serve? Who should we serve? Now, now keep in mind how much that this Samaritan did for this wounded guy. Like, here's what it took to serve him. He interrupted his schedule that day. Ever not serve somebody because you were on schedule? He risked his life, bandaged the wounds, and used his own resources to do it, oil and wine. He physically exerted himself. He walked instead of road. He did not make his planned destination. He stayed awake through the night taking care of him, then hired a guy to continue the care, paid him two days' salary with a commitment for more, and made a promise to return and follow up. Who should we do this for? Who should get that kind of treatment from us? The answer is in the story. It's anyone in our path that needs help. It's not just an enemy. It's anyone in our path that needs our help. So rhetorical question. If there was a whole group of people, like a church, doing that, sacrificially serving people, whoever's in their path that needs help, wouldn't the community be a better place to live? Wouldn't, wouldn't the kingdom of God just be that much more evident as a group of kingdom bringers were actually bringing the kingdom by serving people and what people? 
Anybody who's in your path that needs help? See, I think the key to bringing the kingdom, I think the key to eternal life, the highest quality of life, is serving people, which people, whoever's in your path as you go, that needs your help. And so a large group of people, serving people, ends up serving a whole community. Uh, In the late 90s, I was serving as a youth pastor at Faith Evangelical Church in Billings. Uh, It was a church I grew up in and then was there for 10 years as a youth pastor. In the late 90s, uh, it became clear to me and others that we should plant a church in the Heights area of Billings and that I would be the pastor who would plant that church. And so it was in that era that Adam came to... Uh, Faith E and served as one of our interns in our youth programs where Adam and I really got to know one another. It was in that era where I was kind of doing some double duty. I was getting ready to plant this church while I was also serving as youth pastor. One day I was in my office and I was uh, researching, uh, learning about church planting, starting new churches, and uh, I read an alarming article that stated that communities don't want new churches such that Uh, Planned urban developments, uh, subdivisions, uh, neighborhoods were writing it into their deed restrictions, into their covenants, into the laws that there would be no churches in their community. Now, this isn't good news when you're about to leave your youth pastor job and go start a church. You, you, You learn that people don't want you to start a church. They don't want a church in their neighborhood. It's the, it's the kind of thing that causes a guy to go home to his wife and go, now, honey, uh, this might not take this idea we've got because people don't want it, apparently. Churches are being banned from communities that don't want them to start new works. Now, is that what Jesus had in mind for his churches? The Right, the church deals his idea, his invention, his plan, his strategy, showed us how to do it, left it in our hands. And is that what he wanted to happen? That that his strategy, his plan, these churches would be so impotent and so irrelevant that congregations and buildings would be banned from neighborhoods? Is this what his hope was? Was it his hope that churches would be an irritant rather than a blessing to their communities? Well, certainly it's not what he had in mind. But it's also not how communities thought about the early Christians and their churches. So let's back up a couple thousand years to talk a little ancient history. Uh, The early church, or the first churches. Uh, Let's talk about the the very, very first church. What community, what city did the very first church start in? What town? Um, not in the United States. Okay, so we'll go across the pond. Little country, very enduring, kind of tall and skinny. There you go, Jerusalem. Okay, very, very first church started in Jerusalem. Now, was that church big or small? Very small, relatively small. Uh, The book of Acts tells us about how many? Nice job, 120 people. Okay, now, it got big, and it got big very, very quickly. Such that uh, the writer Luke tells us in the book of Acts that on one day, 3,000 people became Christians. Just in one day. Now the reason he records that is because that's very unusual. Uh, Usually uh, when the church would grow, as people would come to Christ, it was not through mass conversion. But instead it was from one person loving on one person at work, in their neighborhood, at the club or the recreation that they do, and in their family, and inviting them into this eternal life that had been given to them by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Person by person by person, individual by individual. Occasionally there was these moments where thousands would come to Christ, and Luke would record those for us. Well, this movement starts to spread throughout the Roman Empire, of which Jerusalem was a part of the Roman Empire, right? So in 40 AD, historians tell us, so just a few years after Jesus leaves the planet, one one one-thousandth of one percent 
of the Roman Empire were Jesus' followers. Got it? One one thousandth of one percent of the Roman Empire were Jesus' followers when Jesus uh, kind of left it to us. A very inconsequential number. In 350 AD, so let's call it 300 years later, 56% of the Roman Empire were following Jesus. That's a growth rate of 40% per decade for 300 years. We had 120 relatively afraid and confused followers of Jesus that becomes 33 million strong in just 300 years. It would appear that in that era, people wanted churches in their community. Why? I want to deal with that. Uh, Partly because paganism wasn't cutting it. Now, I don't use paganism as a pejorative term. It's a theological designation. Uh, It's Greek mythology. It's Roman religion, which would be polytheistic, many, many, many gods. So there are innumerable gods for every aspect of life. Now, in paganism, in the Roman Empire, there were, frankly, too many cults, too many mysteries, too many philosophies, and they were poorly organized, and there was volatile competition between the cults. Additionally, there was a lack of public reverence for the gods of Roman mythology and paganism. Uh, We know this because, interestingly, archaeologists have uncovered graffiti, literally ancient graffiti that was a slur against the gods. People had a practice of slandering their gods when things didn't go their way. As a matter of fact, they had uh, one custom of beating their gods with a stick. They'd have an icon, you know, a little idol or something for their god. And when things weren't going the way they wanted them to, they'd beat their god with a stick. Now, uh, just want to remind you uh, that we don't beat our god with a stick, but we, we complain uh, verbally. Like we beat God with a stick verbally when things aren't going the way we think our lives should go. But they, well, they pull out a stick and beat their God with it. Uh, now, that makes some sense because the gods of paganism really didn't care about humans in contrast to the God of the Bible who loves people and sent his son Jesus to die for people. Additionally, paganism was priest-driven, so there was nothing really to, for the rest of us to do. Uh, a um, historian who was also an advisor to the emperors, by, a guy by the name of Lactantius, uh, he described in the 300s, uh, he described paganism as uh, worship by the fingertips, a religion of the fingertips. You following? You just, you just touch it. It's not consequential to your life at all. Just religion, worship by the fingertips. Never makes its way into the heart of a man. Transforming him. The bottom of all of that is the inability of paganism and polytheism, pluralism, to generate any sense of belonging. There was really nothing to belong to because, you see, many of those religious movements were closed networks, meaning they failed to keep forming, sustaining relationships and friendships with outsiders, and so they lose their capacity to grow. It's an us for and no more. But Christianity, on the other hand, maintained an open network where everybody was invited and all are welcome because the Christians remembered the thing that Jesus said that... God so loved the world, that's everybody, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, 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 whoever believes in him would not perish but have what the attorney was asking for, which is eternal life. And so Christians started treating people completely different. In the ancient world, was it better to be born a woman or a man? A man. A whole set of rights for men that women didn't have. Uh, little baby girls in the Roman Empire were uh, often died from, quote-unquote, exposure. It's because they were abandoned. Uh, but this new community of Christ-following people realized that men and women are equal. And women started being treated better by Christians than maybe any time ever. Race was not a reason to divide, but it was a reason to celebrate diversity. All of the Roman Empire was organized around status. 
There's very clear lines of status from slavery to freedmen to decurions and uh, equestrians and senators. And you could tell where somebody was in the hierarchy based on their clothes and their jewelry, the chariot they drove, the car, uh, their home. Now, uh, I know for us it's hard to relate to that, right? It's hard for us to imagine uh, an ancient culture where people were judged and evaluated and their status was determined based on their clothes, their jewelry, and their homes. But in that ancient culture, that's the way they thought about each other. But these Christians, they they remembered things like, oh, um, there's no Jew or Greek. There's no slave or free. There's not even men and women. This is, we are one at the foot of the cross. And they started treating each other accordingly such that when there was a festival in which in that culture, lots of festivals, the kind of the calendar of the year was organized around those festivals, you'd have a decurion or, or an equestrian in a house church with a slave and the decurion is serving the slave. That never happened before this. It's because, you see, the Christians welcomed and they loved and they gave dignity to all people because that's exactly what Jesus did and what he told them to do. Particularly, the Christians helped and welcomed people that were in misery because we've romanticized the Roman Empire, but it was a brutal place to live. Life expectancy was incredibly short and, and your quality of life was rather pathetic. There was disease and danger and crime and sickness and filth. And so when the epidemics hit, many people just didn't even have a chance. Historians tell us there were two epidemics, uh, one in 165 and one in 251. And uh, there was a massive contrast in how people were treated in that between paganism and Christianity. They tell us that the epidemics were most likely smallpox. They wiped out one-fourth to one-third of the Roman Empire. At one time in Rome, 5,000 people were dying a day in the city of Rome. There was so much fear about these epidemics that one ancient writer, a guy by the name of Dionysius, writes this. At first onset of the disease, they pushed sufferers away, fled from their dearest, throwing them into the road before they were dead, and treated unburied corpses as dirt, hoping to avert disease. It happened partly because paganism had no real ethic for helping people. But this is the world that people lived in. It's unimaginable. There's three of you. One of you is going to go. And then there was this new community of Christ-following people. And they remembered, or they learned, that Jesus healed the sick, and he had compassion on people, and he touched lepers when nobody else would touch them, and he brought healing and wholeness and wellness to people, and he told his followers to do the same. To who? to whoever's in your path that needs your help. And so they did it. And they did it at great risk to themselves. Dionysius writes this, Most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless uh, heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attend to every need and ministering to them in Christ, and with them departed this life serenely happy, meaning it cost them their own lives. For they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors, and cheerfully accepting their pains. You understand? I'm nursing this person and contracting their disease. I'll end up dying. They will live. Many in nursing and curing others transferred their death to themselves and died in their stead. And the pagans pushed their families away and beat their gods with a stick. Now Dionysius was a Christian, and so maybe uh, we shouldn't uh, give too much credit to his words. Maybe he's exaggerating. And so you consult other writers of the same era, like Julian, who was the emperor of the Roman Empire. Julian was classically Roman, so he was pagan and polytheistic. He would build temples to various gods, and like emperors before him, would pay for the construction through public funds, meaning through tax dollars. So it was no separation of church and state, as it were. And in one letter to a high priest in Galatia, Julian complained that the pagans need to begin equaling the virtues of the Christians and asserted that the recent massive growth of Christianity was caused by their, quote, 
moral character even if pretended. You follow him? Like such a cynic, such an opponent to Christianity that he's going, I think the reason they're growing is because of their moral character. But I think they're faking their moral character just to grow their churches. He added, uh, by their benevolence towards strangers and their care for the graves of the dead. This in contrast to the culture. In another letter, Julian writes this to a high priest. He says, I think that when the poor happen to be neglected and overlooked by the priests, it's a, uh, worship by the fingertips, we'll just let the priests do it. I think when the poor happen to be neglected and overlooked by the priests, the impious Christians observed this and devoted themselves to benevolence. Now, what he doesn't understand is that the reason that the Christians devoted themselves to benevolence is because that's what Jesus did to them and what Jesus told them to do to others. But his conclusion is, is they're seeing this market niche. And so they're devoting themselves to benevolence. And then he writes, the impious Christians support not only their poor, but ours as well. Because they were in the path. Refused to rock, walk around them. The Romans helped the Romans. The Jews helped the Jews. The Egyptians helped the Jew, Egyptians. The Christians, well, they helped anybody in their path needed help. Julian hated the Christians. Hated them. But he knew that their love and their deeds were so relevant and so tangible that even Julian would be bummed if the Christians ceased to exist. He knew that the empire was better with the Christians. And so Christianity grew and the world got better. And it happened because in comparison, Pagan was weak and left wanting and drifted into obscurity and is now just silly tales of lore. It happened because the way of Jesus is a superior worldview and a superior lifestyle that the followers of Jesus took his words at face value Love your neighbor as yourself. It is more blessed to give than to receive. That he came into the world not to be served, but to serve and to give his life away. And so they started doing the same thing. And it happens that their local churches mattered to the world. I assert that this is why Christianity grew at a pace of 40% per decade for 310 years. Question if it would have continued at that rate, how many Christians would there be in the world today? You can do the math, right? Yeah, so you go 40 to 350, 40% to 133 million. Got it? It's been 1,700 years just running out. Okay, here's the number. Now, I know that looks like your national debt, but it's, it, it's, it's a little bigger than that. Okay, 40% growth rate per decade. That, that's a number, that, it's kind of an impronounceable number, right? You, you have to use that little, what's that thing called, the little number at the top? Well, yeah, power of, yeah, yeah, what, how many zeros that is. Okay, so, so something's happened, didn't it? Why, why did it stop? Why did Christianity stop growing like that? Why did it stop bettering the world? Why are we banned and banished and mistreated and mocked? Is it because we stop serving people? Is it because we don't love our neighbor? We're walking around people. Beaten and bruised and laying in a path. It's not an interstate. It's a path. And you physically got to do this to get around them. We somehow got inward. We stopped obeying Jesus' command to go and do likewise. I think. And so I'm sitting in my office and I'm reading an article that tells me that communities don't want churches anymore. And God didn't let me up. 
he in that moment was saying, you think deeply on this for a minute, Vern. Uh, communities didn't want churches. But as a guy was planning a neighborhood or a development, they would write into the deed restrictions, the codes, the, the zoning. We'll take a gas station and a restaurant, but don't need a church. Now why? How, what's the thinking behind that? This is what God was doing with me. You think deep. Take this down the, the, the layers here. Take a gas station, take a restaurant, don't want a church. Why? Because the gas station matters to my life. The restaurant matters. It's useful. Catch word is, it's relevant to me, right? I, I got a car, I need fuel, so I need a gas station, and I got to eat, and sometimes it's nice to have somebody else make the food, and I'd like to get it quickly, so we're going to go ahead and have a restaurant, but don't need a church. Gas station, I need that. Restaurant, need that. Those are relevant to me. I don't need church. Not relevant. doesn't matter. Okay, but you go down another layer. Wait a minute. What's the message of the church? We know what the message of the gas station is and the message of the restaurant is. What's the message of the church? The message of the church is what the attorney was asking about. It's eternal life. And then you go, wait a minute. There's nothing more relevant than eternal life. A quick burger and a tank of gas. I mean, that matters right here, but... Does there anything matter more than eternal life, than living the highest quality of life and a life that lasts forever? Nothing more relevant than that. And so then the Lord was like, now you think about this. If, if, if the message of the church is eternal life and nothing matters more than that, but people are going, the church doesn't matter. It's not relevant to my life. Where did this connect happen? It ain't God's fault. It's not the Bible's fault. Whose fault is that? We got to take that one, don't we, church folk? That's ours. We own that one. We've turned it into worship by the fingertips, apparently, and that isn't relevant to people. And so I realized in that moment, like, you better matter. If you're going to start a new church, because people don't want any churches, it better matter to the community. As a matter of fact, the community needs to look at the church and go... Uh, they don't contribute to the community because they're of their tax-exempt status. But what they bring is worth more than any tax dollar could ever bring us. And so we started serving uh, even before we started services, trying to just make Billings a better place to live. And it's now why we do things like shut down a weekend worship service to spread out, scatter over our community and serve. That's why we lead some festivals, Easter eggs and um, Fourth of July stuff because our community needed that kind of gathering. That's why we have an ambulance that goes out three times a week and serves uh, the poor, the homeless. That's why we're trying to build a pool for our community because it's just something that was in our path that God put there that he didn't want us to walk around. Got a call a couple of years ago around Christmas time from a lady uh, who asked if we have a, a rent a Santa program. Okay, so we're at church. This lady calls in and goes, Do you have a rent a Santa program? And my, my, our, our secretary, she tells me the story. It's, you know, she was just perplexed, like, Are you serious? It, it, it was one of the single greatest moments for me as a pastor when I heard that. Because what was that lady thinking? She was thinking, this church does a lot for the community. I have this need. And I don't know, maybe they can help. Maybe they do it. They already do some other crazy things. You see, see someday, maybe it's already happened, that lady is going to come up against a real need. Right? It's not about a Santa. It's going to be something to do with eternal life. And she knows who to call. I love narrate because you're already doing this, and that's what I mean by preaching to the choir, where you know you're climbing wall and being involved, sponsoring Alive at Five, and your involvement at Ales for Trails, and uh, the stuff you do with the pine beetles, lumber stuff, you know. And by the way, I was thinking that you guys should combine Ales for Trails and the pine beetle deal. And, and do wine for pine. It's just an idea. 
I think that came from the Lord. I'm just... <laughs> This is the stuff that's God's intention for his church, that you would matter. So we constantly ask the question, how can we serve and give and love and make life better and bring the kingdom and that up there would actually come down here as we are walking out eternal life and inviting people into it and never stepping around people in our path that need our help. And you're doing it, and I encourage you to do it all the more. So you jump in the Gran Torino, and you stuff your foot to the floor, and you fire that thing up, and you blow through those old barbecues. But you are doing that because you know this is what you're going to do when you get that old barbecue out of the way. And that is is that you're going to build something very practical and very useful and very beautiful. Something that matters. Something that is eternal life and invites people into that life. And to whom will you do it? To whoever's in your path that needs your help. Like the Good Samaritan. And so I just channel the words of Jesus and say, go and do likewise. And I'd like to pray for you, please. So, Father, we um, are inspired by the story that Jesus brilliantly told of a guy who was a presumed enemy who, uh, was, who condescended and was graceful and loving and then at great cost to himself served somebody who was in his path. God... Uh, would you please forgive us for the number of times that we keep walking around people that are in our path? It is a narrow path. There they are. They are you. May we serve them and bring eternal life. Pray for narrate, God, that this place uh, would uh, embrace the ethic, uh, the passion of Jesus. Um, that we'd be uh, nurtured and built up and encouraged and edified and the scattering would actually happen. Because Lord, uh, think, I, I think of um, when everybody scatters, that's, everybody's got a path. There's this spider web of paths. And in every one of those paths, there's people that need help. What a revolution, what a revival would happen, God, as narrate serves whoever's in their path. May they do it genuinely and passionately, effectively, successfully, joyfully. And in a way that makes the kingdom of God come to earth up there down here, that more and more and more people would enjoy and enjoy and enjoy eternal life. Praise these things in Jesus' great name. Amen. Bless you guys.